Music is a strong theme in my life. It always was that thing I could run to, that thing, that refuge of some kind that I could escape into. Because when you're singing a song, you really kind of aren't thinking. You just get, you get elevated, you get transported to another place. And traditionally in my family, uh, music was really important. My grandfather was a composer of uh, the village marching band scores in his native uh, Portugal. And my mother sang in the church choir. She'd have her choir practice at the house in the living room. I was surrounded by music constantly and musical myths and stories for my family. And so, yeah, my family held music in a high place. From the age of four to the age of 18, I had really regular music lessons, whether they were at school or in the Portuguese community. And I loved it, you know. My musical background, I think, is what really helps me in the music business today because I can. I can navigate my way through so many genres and I can be comfortable with lots of different circles of uh, musicians. The first time I had a vision of, you know, my dream to be a musician was when I was four years old and my mother and I sang a duet for about 300 people at a church event. And immediately when I walked out onto that stage, I felt the energy of the audience and I felt like I was making them happy and I felt like I was making them smile and that they really appreciated it. And right then I had a vision of singing for thousands of people. The move from the small town of Victoria to Toronto at the age of 17 was fueled by my desire to make it in the music biz. And I knew one producer and I was determined to go and, and hang out and record songs and try to get a record deal. Once I arrived in Toronto, my fate was a little bit different because you know, I had to get a job, I was working at an office, a nine to five job, I was, you know, struggling at it and using my paychecks to record songs. Eventually, I realized I wasn't ready mentally for it, nor musically, because I wasn't writing songs autonomously yet because I hadn't learned to play guitar. So I flew back home to my parents' house, I enrolled in the local college and I bought an acoustic guitar and that, you know, led me down a whole other path. I, know I was recording these songs for this group, Nellstar, and eventually there was a talent show at the end of the year called The Honey Jam and it was a talent for R&B and hip hop acts and at the time trip hop kind of fit into the urban category. So I, I snuck my way into the competition and I performed and that night I met Gerald Eaton, one half of track and field, the producers who would go on to produce my first album, Woe Nelly. And I also met my manager that night. So it was a really pivotal night for me. I still wasn't ready to go for it full force. But eventually they coaxed me back to do a full length demo with them and we sat in Brian's attic studio and really just picked our brains apart. We really worked as a team, a production team. I was the third producer on that project. And you know, I, I put my heart and soul into, into the album. A lot of the songs from the demo tape ended up on my album. I flew to New York when I was, you know, I think I had just turned 19. And my manager and I, we bought a cheap ticket to New York. We stayed at his aunt's house in Brooklyn and took the train in every day to go to record company meetings. And eventually we created a little whirlwind and buzz around my sound. And I had uh, little photos that I had taken at the strip mall from a photo booth. And those were my, you know, promotional photos I was using. I wrote the bio myself. It was kind of like a little one page rant about myself. And people liked it because it was different and it was original. So eventually, I signed a record deal. I was about, I just turned 20. Writing and recording Woe Nelly, I think we knew we were doing something special and we knew that it was good music, but we didn't know that millions of people would go on to buy the album. You know, it ended up selling, you know, seven million albums and we had no idea when we recorded it. One could only dream of selling, you know, you could only dream of selling a thousand records when you're just making something. So, we knew we were on to something good, but we didn't know the magnitude. And when I'm on the road now, I always feel for the young artists that are just starting out, that are like 18, 19, and they're just caught in this whirlwind of touring. I always feel for them, because I was, you know, my album came out, I was almost 21, and I, I could barely handle, you know, the exhaustion, the sort of mental kind of displacement of suddenly being famous overnight. I was living in a, a loft, a one bedroom loft at the time. And all of a sudden I remember going on the internet and having fans and blogs and people talking about me. And it was bizarre to me. At one point I would get panic attacks when I left the house. <laughs> I would go out by myself and 
all of a sudden just feel very uh, uncomfortable. So I did. I dealt with it all right. It was okay, but it was there was some rough patches. Um, luckily, I had really close friends and family around me a lot of the time, and they sort of like kept me afloat. One day, I just you know I I it kind of hit me. You know, I think I hadn't absorbed all the great things that had happened to me, and then. Three years later, I found myself sitting in my house. I, I was living in LA at the time, and I went, wow, what does it all mean anyway? Because when you're so young and you achieve so many of your dreams, you know, so quickly, like I'd already won a Grammy, I'd already opened for U2, I had sung with Aretha Franklin, it was pretty amazing. And then I wanted to kind of be pensive, and with folklore, I was just being very pensive and really reflecting on my life, because I think what makes me an artist is that I use art to work out things in my life. I use art to understand myself better. And I express the way I feel about the world through writing and through songs. And on folklore, I was, it's kind of a selfish album in a way, because it's therapeutic for me to, to explore my roots so that I can move forward. Because when you, when, you, when you gain success very quickly, you start to question why you deserve it. You start to question where you come from. And I come from very humble roots. And that's why I explore my, my working class roots and my, my Portuguese heritage. I explore it quite closely on, on folklore because I felt like I needed to go back in order to go forwards. And that's why this new album, Loose, is so, so different. It's because I have been able to purge a lot of things personally through my I started recording folklore when I was about five months pregnant and I finished it when I was, you know, post, you know, nine weeks plus pregnant. And that's why it's such a special album for me because it's such an intimate record and I was in such a wonderful state of mind emotionally or state of, you know, state of being. And it did come out about two months after my daughter was born, which was big blur. <laughs> I've never worked so hard in my life. You know, it was one year of like, Literally, I would do two hours of interviews, then run back to my hotel room and, and nurse my daughter. And <laughs> I ended up nursing her for a couple of years because we were traveling so much. And it was really, really fun. I can't wait till she's older and I can tell her all the stories. You know, we were in Japan, we were all over Europe, <laughs> UK, all over North America. It was really fun. But at the same time, it was really hard. And, you know, the, the album, we, we toured pretty extensive, extensively in, in Europe and the UK. And, then when we recorded Loose, she was there with me in Miami and that was really fun. I felt like I was having my cake and eating it too. After Folklore, you know, I toured for, for a little while and then I went home and I was having fun being a mom, just staying at home with my daughter and waking up, making breakfast, listening to Rafi and, <laughs> you know, doing my thing. And, and then eventually I started, you know, I needed a hobby. So I uh, took up acting classes went and really discovered a new side of myself. And that's kind of where the character on Loose is kind of born. I really learned to let go of my ego when it comes to creativity and just feel free to fall flat on your face and not be afraid of, you know, jumping into the deep end of the pool. And really, really, really huge for me. And from that, you know, my writing changed. After acting classes, my writing became more free uh, I started rapping more, I started being more fearless about genres and styles. And then I started recording, you know, I, I spent about a year recording Loose because I worked with so many different producers before I finally encountered Timbaland in Miami and it was like, we, we share a musical love and just like lovers who haven't seen each other in years but still feel that chemistry when they see each other, it was like, Hadn't seen him in five years, but didn't make a difference. We were, we were making music within minutes. For this album, I, pre, I had pre-written some lyrics, but a lot of the lyrics I wrote in the studio because Timbaland's beats usually inspire um, a hook idea for me or a melody. Um, occasionally, Timbaland would suggest a flow uh, on a certain songs. Promiscuous, I wrote with a rapper from Alabama and I had to be really open-minded. It was the first time I had ever not written all the lyrics to a song. So I was like freaked out about it. But then once I let myself get into it, I had a blast. And it's nice to kind of have a separation from the song where it's your song, but you're not completely in it because you didn't write every line. That was a freeing experience for me. Timbaland though, anything he plays on the keyboard, I have a melody for. Because I don't know what it is between us, but just he inspires me endlessly. Like, it's like a bottomless pit. When I was in the studio with Tim, I knew that the music we were making was special, but of course I didn't know how people would react to it, especially when you haven't been on the scene in a while. 
and the sound was really drastically different. You never know how people are going to react. But I knew that it was good music, and usually good music kind of perseveres, I've found over the years. The album's been incredible for me. I've never had, you know, long running number one singles. You know, Promiscuous was number one for nine weeks in the US. It's the biggest hit of the year. I never dreamed of having, you know, the biggest hit of the year anywhere. <laughs> Obviously, I've had hits before, like I'm Like a Bird was pretty huge, but everything I've done now kind of has surpassed all of that, and I'm so happy. I think it's great, because I'm doing like the music that I love the best. Like I love to rap, and I love to be funky on stage. I love to move. I love rhythmic music, and I think now that my rhythmic music is having the most success, you know, over my whole career, uh, it's wonderful. I feel like I can really be myself and have fun with it on my career, which has been about seven years. Uh, it's nice to, to be on my third album. You feel a lot more, you know, you feel a lot more grounded and solid in the business and you have three albums. Definitely, it always comes to mind is the gig that I did at Slane Castle um, with U2 in Dublin. Opening for them was a dream come true and seeing 100,000 people wave their hands in the air time like a bird was a pivotal moment for me. I was about 22 and I had really dreamed of that, and that, that vision I had when I was four years old of performing for thousands was really realized that night. Uh, I did this tour called the Area One Tour with Moby and Outkast and The Roots and Incubus and Paul Oakenfold, and that was a monumental tour in the US because it was fusion. It was more like the European festival uh, sort of set up with a diverse uh, lineup. And, you know, I, I participated in Lilith Fair the last year, the third and final year of Lilith Fair. That was neat because it was part of history. Obviously, winning a Grammy Award was really, really, really beautiful moment. And more recently, probably writing with people, like writing with Chris Martin from Coldplay and Timbaland. The three of us that night was like one of those really unforgettable evenings. You know, I never really plan, you know, succinctly what I want to do next. It usually hits me like a ton of bricks. I just go, oh, that's what's next. I think that Loose was in the works for a while. I knew that my third album should be a little more iconic and a little bit more simplified and definitely a lot more urban. I knew I had it in me and I hadn't kind of wielded that weapon yet. I was kind of saving it for when people least expected it. And so in the future, you know, I've been talking about a lot of different things, you know, from doing a Latin language album to doing, you know, maybe a band project with Timbaland, or who knows, maybe jazz music.